Okay, cool. All right. So, uh, just the agenda. It's a little bit different than what we had initially displayed. Um, so I'm going to introduce myself and, and, and Hawk. Uh, we'll talk about conveyor monitoring. Uh, we'll go through the technology that we're presenting today as a uh, solution for that. We'll run through installation and commissioning. Uh, we're going to look at some results. Um, we'll have a look at uh, the kind of outputs you get. I'm even going to go through what it's going to cost to put one of these systems in and, and the kind of expected savings you'll receive and a couple of examples we've, we've done. Uh, I'll have a look at the future of some of the uh, applications uh, and we'll have a look at some of the other applications that we do as well. Um, yeah, so move forward. Uh, so who am I? I? My name's Matt. That's a picture of me there. Uh, my hair is not quite so scruffy at this point, uh, although it's a lot greyer. Um, I have a Bachelor of Mining Engineering at uh, UNSW. Uh, finished that in about uh, 20, 2013. Uh, I did a research project on surfactant use, um, so a lot of uh, monitoring of bubbles. Uh, in water columns, uh, in, for froth flotation optimization, looking at using the effects of salt water and that kind of thing. Uh, I've worked with um, Hawk effectively since I finished uni. Uh, internal sales for two years, I uh, was an application engineer kind of as part of that and a little bit onwards as a more kind of dedicated role. Uh, and I've been a product manager for the fiber optic product for ooh, just nearly two years now. Uh, so that's kind of me as a background. Uh, as a company, uh, we are a process control specialist, uh, specifically in uh, sense, front-end sensing. So we were founded in uh, 1988. Uh, we are single owner, uh, privately, completely privately owned. Uh, we've got about 30 years of experience in various industries, specifically mining. Uh, so this one, this application we're talking about today is kind of really in our in our bailiwick. Um, we have our own in-house R&D. Uh, we have a R&D first and um, really a, a very R&D heavy uh, kind of business structure. Um, we kind of work with a uh, signal sensing first. So all of our products are designed to get the most amount of energy uh, into and out of the field in terms of um, whatever we're sensing with, whether it's acoustics, whether it's light. So we put as much energy out as we can and we capture as much to get the strongest signal. It's kind of been the development process through everything we do uh, is to really get that uh, initial uh, sensing uh, as strong as possible. So let's talk about the application. Uh, why do we want to monitor conveyors? Well, uh, they tend to go wrong. Uh, this has uh, been kind of my uh, topic for the last two years of field work. Um, I've been to mine sites where, uh, had I been there a few days earlier, I would have seen the belt of flames. Um, they, they definitely go wrong. Um, and they're big and they're mechanical, there's lots of failure points, and when they go wrong fast enough and hard enough, they tend to burn down, rip, tear, there's all sorts of things that can go wrong with them, and these can result in some pretty nasty, uh, pretty nasty circumstances. Um, I discovered this topic as being a problem in terms of inspection uh, when I was at university. Uh, it was mentioned that it was a uh, the problem of walking the belts was actually a legislated one in coal underground mines in New South Wales specifically. Um, and as being part of the bulk material handling and measuring, uh, it's definitely part of our uh, natural fit in terms of our applications. So we might have level sensors looking at um, material on belts. We do block shoot sensors, so uh, transfer points, um, you know, stockpiling. We work on uh, different material loaders. Uh, um, stacker reclaimers, uh, ship loaders. So we have a pretty good idea of how the whole bulk handling thing typically operates. So this is kind of a natural fit for us. Um, one of the big things as well with this product is it's going to be an easy retrofit. So unlike pipeline leak detection, which is another application we've, we've done a bit of, uh, you don't have to wait five years for the pipeline process to be approved. You can install one of these things, you know, the whole project can be done in uh, three to six months, depending on you know how how big it is and how quick everyone wants to move. So you've got a, a good turnaround in terms of uh, getting these things installed and keeping a 
getting a site basically automatically monitoring very quickly. So uh, when we um, when we monitor conveyors, we're really talking about uh, loss of infrastructure um, and downtime that can be measured in months. Uh, how does this occur? Well, this is a, a simplified variation of what can happen. Typically, if we're talking about wear, uh, it's either bearing or uh, shell wear. Um, those things typically happen because of age. Um, sometimes there are failures in or, or flaws in the actual construction um, that can lead to this, but, but it is mostly a wear and tear kind of thing. Um, bearing failures can lead to shell failures. I think you could fairly say that shell failures can lead to bearing failures. Um, and uh, you can get into uh, kind of a step-by-step -step process by which uh, this all goes horribly wrong. As you can see there in red, that's where you have some real problems. Um, pretty much everything you do in this uh, in this kind of uh, workflow, if you end up moving to the right, you're going to start having uh, production loss problems almost straight away. Um, one of the two uh, items I'd also like to point out is spontaneous shit, uh, spontaneous shell and spontaneous bearing failure, because they're kind of one of the big ones uh, that we can't currently get with. Uh, today's methodology of manual inspection. That's something that we're going to talk about as having a bit more value. All right. Uh, the failure of, uh, the, the method of failure can be very fast or very slow. Um, and there's historically very little on spontaneous shell failure and spontaneous bearing failure that can be done. Um, it is a real possibility that, uh, the uh, loss of material and loss of uh, infrastructure uh, can happen. Uh, I've been to, you know, I think three sites now that have had a belt burned down in one way or another. So the kind of status quo uh, is manual inspections. One of the good things about manual inspections is you're physically putting boots on the ground. Um, you're going to cover your statutory requirements, if especially if it's an underground mine. There are other maintenance issues. Um, that you're going to be able to pick up. Um, loose bolts uh, is a big one. Um, if you've got uh, any kind of problems with the ground or um, you've got buildup of material occurring in a particular area, that's the kind of thing you're going to be able to catch with your eyes as you're moving around when you're doing an inspection. Um, there's also the advantage that uh, you increase operator familiarity with equipment. However, you know, if you've got an operator who's been around a while, this is probably going to not be as much of a thing. It's definitely good for uh, new operators to be doing manual inspections so that they can actually see the kind of equipment they're looking after, though. Uh, disadvantages. Well, I think we all kind of know them, but functionally, um, it's a subjective measurement. Uh, I have put two inspectors, one after the other, walking down the same belt. Uh, they have given a result. Um, based on their inspections with a correlation of zero. So that means there was no relationship between what one inspector saw and what another inspector saw. And they were both considered by the site to be um, well-trained and experienced operators. It is a monotonous manual task. Um, if you have an inspector doing this at the end of a shift, as opposed to the start of a shift, uh, you're going to get a very poor result. Um, You've also got uh, the expertise required for a person to be able to say, I think that roller is going to last another two weeks. Uh, the other problem too, it's a biological one, there's something called a loud sound response in the ear. If you are trying to do this via a uh, sound, you know, listening, like an oral measurement, um, you're going to run into the problem that the human ear will protect itself from loud drowning, droning noises. Um, it actually does that by pulling one of the little hammers away from the drum of the ear. It's actually a, a little little muscle that pulls that away to dampen sound reaching the inner ear to protect it from damage. It's also costly. Um, you need teams of people to do this. Uh, you require scheduling of this. It can be one per day, one per shift inspection routine, and it does put people in the line of fire. Uh, really, that's one of the ones that a lot of people are now trying to, trying to reduce, uh, is to pull people out of the field as much as possible. Right, so manual inspection. Uh, it will catch bearing wear, it will catch shell wear, it'll catch roller collapse. If you are using thermographic 
uh, cameras or heat guns, it may catch bearing heating, although bearing heating does not always occur. You can have bearings that catastrophically fail uh, and never go above ambient temperature. Uh, it, it does happen. Or Sorry, bearings and rollers that do that. Uh, you may catch a spontaneous shell failure or a spontaneous bearing failure. Uh, we'll have a chat about what a spontaneous uh, failure is a bit later. But one of the things I'd like to point out is that unless you are there when that failure is occurring, and remember they are spontaneous for a reason, um, you're not going to catch it. So if it's a one hour quick failure and you're not there, you, you know, you've got a 23 out of 24 chance that you're going to miss it in, in that inspection that day. Now you might get lucky, but chances are you won't. Um, so uh, we also talked to some people about monitoring temperature. Now, there are ways of monitoring temperature automatically um, through this methodology, and, and Hawk does produce a temperature sensing uh, fiber optic um, system, but it's not recommended as a standard or a standalone approach uh, for the reason that, as you can see here, there are plenty of ways for uh, the failure mechanism to complete without ever getting hot. Um, the reason I have bearing failure and bearing fire in those in those uh, dotted boxes is because uh, when you try and detect a uh, bearing getting hotter, you're not always going to be able to do so because you're relying on radiant heat coming from the bearing to the fiber over a set distance. Now, radiant heat is a terrible way of transferring heat. Uh, it's, I think, less than 10%, whereas convection and con conduction are the real way of going about it. But unfortunately, you can't get contact with a, uh, a, a bearing because it's moving uh, and you can't really get convection because you've got an open environment and wind can move heat away. Bearing uh, belt fire, I've got in dotted lines because yes, it's very detectable. Um, it has to get to a certain point. The heating has to get to a certain point uh, where it causes uh, combustion. Um, once it's done that though, uh, you will be able to detect it um, based on say a cantonary wire. The response of a fire detection system it can be very good, um, and it's a, actually a quite effective way to put um, fire detection along the uh, conveyor. Very cost effective compared to installing, you know, smoke detectors, heat detectors, that kind of thing. Um, uh, and it's a good way of of handling that problem. But I mean, if your belt's on fire, you're already looking at scheduled uh, unscheduled downtime immediately. Um, you're, you're going to have to fight that fire. So you've already gone way too far down that uh, down that failure chain for you to really be getting the value out of a system like this. So my main recommendation when it comes to temperature is it's a great secondary measurement. It is not designed for primary measurement, um, and unfortunately, I have seen it spruiked as that. Uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't personally do it. Um, a lot of people do, that do use thermographic cameras uh, that I've spoken to have had mixed results over the last you know, five or six years. Uh, I have had one site that I'm working with at the moment refer to it as a gimmick or a gadget. Um, and again, not all bearings that fail get hot, I, especially ones that fail catastrophically. Um, it's quite often a mechanical failure that causes the roller to um, undergo a rapid, unexpected uh, disintegration. Uh, so, Let's talk about the technology. So what's actually happening here is we are sending light down a fiber. Uh, if you guys are familiar with how fiber optics work, effectively it's a long thin piece of glass, light that goes in one end of the piece of glass, effectively all of it makes it out the other end. That's not quite true. Uh, some of it does scatter. We actually use that scattered light um, as part of our sensing. I won't go too much into the physics of that now, but there's a whole bunch of different scatter effects that cause light to break up like they would in a prism and the way the light breaks up is changed by physical impacts and temperature changes and strain on the fiber and that's actually one of the things we use to get acoustic and temperature and strain depending on the application so we use different types of glass but most of the glass we use is communication uh, grade glass like the long range backbone communication range uh, there are single mode and multi mode fibers. Effectively, the multi mode stuff is all the things you use inside a building. We tend to use the single mode stuff so we can do all the long ranges. Uh, we will talk today about some applications that can handle 80 kilometer application ranges with a single unit. So, uh, what does this thing look like? Well, 
as part of the technology, you don't have to put any communication in the field. You don't have to put any power in the field. You don't have to put, uh, you don't have to worry about sending uh, dangerous levels of light down the, down the uh, fiber. We're a class 1M uh, device, which means that we're effectively like a regular handheld laser pointer, except invisible. Um, so we, you don't have that the laser risk in the field. We are immune to EMF. Um, about the only thing that's going to hurt us is if the cable is broken uh, and that is repairable. Um, we're not going to have any problems with, you know, large plant or anything like that. It's just not going to be an issue for us. Um, the basic concept of how this thing is, well, you can see that big blue line going up and down that conveyor. That's effectively what we do. We put a fiber along the conveyor and it monitors vibration at each one of those points. It actually monitors vibration at every point. Every crystal in the glass is monitoring vibration over the entire length. We actually chop all that information up as it comes back to us. Um, and we use a time of flight calculation to work out where it's coming from. We look at the scatter to work out what's happening at that location. If you're looking at some further information, uh, you could definitely look at, uh, I've, got, I've got some more information you guys can have a look at or, um, uh, you could ha you could research Rayleigh backscatter or Brillouin backscatter. Uh, there's some of the different methodologies used to actually, um, and I can email you those links if you if you let me know. I'll make sure I put my contact details up at the end. Um, but uh, there's a lot of information available. But functionally, here we're going to go through the application itself. Uh, the big one here that I'm going to point out is that we have metal to fiber contact. Uh, that stringer. Where all the uh, where all the roller frames, the idler frames, are actually attached to, is kind of our bread and butter of, of sensing. So, what does a Praetorian do? All right, so it'll take a regular single mode fiber, and it's going to turn it into a thermometer. Well, it's actually two thermometers and two strain gauges and a single microphone every 250 millimeters for up to 40 kilometers, depending on the application. So a single unit with two channels at 40 kilometers can handle the equivalent of 1.6 million individual instruments if you do the math, which is crazy. Uh, you could not uh, do that kind of uh, monitoring with, a, with conventional devices. You have to go distributed for that. 1.6 million instruments, even if they're 100 bucks each, you know, it starts not looking very well for uh, budgeting. So these instruments are able to uh, really pick up everything that's going on on a line. So if you can draw a line on it, effectively you can monitor it with one of one of these units. And that line can be up to 40 kilometers long. So any kind of application like perimeter security, anything you can draw on a map effectively. Uh, as I said before, uh, we work on uh, different physical principles. Uh, we have a time of flight calculation, which is done via a clock in the system. Uh, we have, uh, you can effectively think of the fiber as acting as a contact microphone. Uh, it's not gonna pick up the kind of sound that you would expect to hear if you were standing next to the same problem. So if you're listening to someone digging a hole in the ground through buried fiber, it's not gonna sound exactly like that. It's definitely gonna pick up things that are well below your hearing uh, capability. So well below that 20 Hertz level. Uh, we can go above human hearing. We can go below human hearing depending on the application in terms of uh, frequency pickup. So uh, it's a little different though, because it's contact microphone and not a uh, air pickup microphone. Okay, uh, this is what it looks like when it's installed. Um, you can see here on the left-hand side, uh, we've actually got the unit there. Uh, and then directly above it, there's a little patch panel, which allows us to connect the two fibers on the right-hand side, which are leading into the back of the unit, to the 12 fibers that are in the field. Uh, this is what they look like. Um, they typically live in a rack, like a server rack, which are typically in your, uh, you know, your power uh, substations or communication substations. We generally run a fiber optic from that substation to wherever we're starting the application, that can be any distance up to the 40 kilometers. Um, the idea there being that uh, we don't actually do any detection there. We blank all that out and remove that from the detection algorithm along that detection area. We've laid them in conduits. You can put them over existing cable trays, whatever's convenient based on the site. We'll come out and actually walk that area with you to make sure that you're having an effective uh, implementation of, of the different routes and things like that. And it's gonna be suitable. Um, as you can see there, we, we generally support these with uh, remote modems. You can see at the top left there, there's that little modem, which is connected to those two big antennas off to the side there. Right, 
in terms of uh, support and literature, um, we've actually done a bit of work with uh, Swinburne University. Um, the understandings of how a bearing fails and what that failure sounds like uh, is actually able to be related back to uh, these frequencies, depending if it's the uh, if it's a ball bearing uh, that's got the problem, if it's the inner race, if it's the outer race, or if it's actually a shell failure based on the speed of rotation, which is based on the, the roller size and the belt speed. So they're different factors we actually take into consideration with our analysis. Uh, and we're able to kind of look for fundamental frequencies that we know are known to be associated with rollers of that make and size. So if you were to do a project like this with us, I would actually ask for the bearing type that you're using and probably samples to bring back to base here that we would uh, we would take apart and have a, have a good look at and take measurements from. It's kind of those those small measurements that we take are gonna be the, the critical ones on the actual bearing itself. So in terms of the what the technology is gonna cover, well, uh, it's gonna cover all the pathways to failure. So we are gonna pick up bearing wear, we're gonna pick up shell wear, we're gonna pick up roller collapse. The other thing too that we're gonna pick up that your guys in the field are not gonna be able to pick up is spontaneous shell failure and spontaneous bearing failure. Uh, the main thing with, uh, the main reason that's gonna happen is because, well, we're there all the time. So our unit's monitoring 24 seven. It's gonna take a recording at a set interval, generally every few minutes, uh, and it will actually process that recording. We can run live, um, although it does require a lot more uh, processing. Uh, typically we minute on, minute off, or uh, two minutes on, two minutes off is typical to what we do. It depends application to application uh, and the speed in, in which failures are expected to be. Um, we don't actually look at the bearing heating with the standard application, although that is something we can do, uh, although as I said before, it's not necessarily a very accurate way of doing things. Uh, so we leave that out. However, we are covering pathways outside uh, that encompass all of the inputs and outputs of the bearing heating failure mode. So we're going vibration first. That's really what we're looking for. Uh, we're also a bit more accurate than the guys in the field. The only reason being is that we don't vary day to day. So the recordings that we make are the recordings that we make. We don't have an opinion in terms of how that bearing sounds, uh, we make a recording and compare it against known values uh, that we have done through the actual, uh, through that actual process. Uh, so uh, let's talk about how we install these things. So I'm gonna try and get this to play here. So we run a fiber optic cable pulled along the belt we then take, uh, it goes along the return. We then lift that into position and place it in the uh, lower section or in the web of the uh, existing stringer. And we then take uh, all sorts of different types of mounting methods to actually permanently affix that to that structure. So we show the clips there. Um, that's actually not the main way of doing it. I'll play that again so everyone can have a look. So effectively, Try that again. We pull the fiber along the conveyor along the return belt. We then take that, move it to the stringer, and then we take whatever mounting method. In this case, we're showing clips, and we actually mount that to the stringer. So it's nice and straightforward. Guys, as I said before, if you do have any questions, please put them in the chat and I'll keep an eye out for them as we go. So uh, we spoke about clips earlier. The clips that you see here are just girder clips. Uh, this was a really early uh, attempt um, and I would not recommend girder clips again. The main reason is those uh, little sections of fiber in between the girder clips bounce around a lot. Uh, also, these have to be installed on 300 mil center to center. Um, that is a lot. Uh, it works out 
you know, thousands of go to clips and you get pretty good at putting them on, but they still take a bit of time. Uh, so we have different methods depending on the belt configuration. So we actually have an application data sheet you can fill out and we'll, we'll give you the information. We provide everything as a package. Uh, so we have a factory here in which we can manufacture them, uh, all the components uh, for the mechanical installation to length for your belt specifically. So we'll ask a lot of information about the actual purlin dimensions and material and that kind of thing. And then we have it so you can just clip it all on or bolt it all on or screw it all on. We have different ways of handling that. And uh, yeah, you're able to secure the fiber into position and, and, and make sure you've got a consistent and good measurable vibration signature out of them. So what can you cover? Well, what we see here is an entire mine. Uh, it's being covered by two separate devices. Uh, we have a single um, uh, IoT enabled uh, um, uh, processor, which is actually going to take the vibration signatures from both interrogators. So the actual unit that sends the light out is called an interrogator because um, it interrogates the fiber. It's just the, uh, unfortunately, that's the what they've decided to call the um, the the box, so to speak. Uh, the idea is that we, we cover these fibers. You can see the linkages in red and green, depending on where these route to. Uh, and you're actually able to cover a remarkable amount of material, uh, remarkable amount of belts with one or two of these devices. Um, and these uh, run a fiber down each side of each conveyor. So that way we, we give a, a failure, not only to say that a particular frame is having a problem, we also can indicate left, right, center based on the difference between the two uh, between the, the two channels on that conveyor. So let's have a look at some of the results we got. Well, uh, this was uh, a major trial application we did in Western Australia. It's returns fine conveyor, um, about 1.6k long, uh, operating at nearly 6,000 tons per hour. Very intermittent loading because it is coming from a screenhouse. Uh, so it runs up to 5,900 tons per hour, but depending on the amount of fines being screened from the material at any one time, it can be zero or it can be 6,000 tons per hour. Uh, we ran a, uh, a fiber down both sides of the conveyor. Uh, where we're standing here uh, in, this, in the image of this photo, uh, where it's taken from, you can see the belt uh, in the sky on the right. It's all raised up there. That's the belt. So we monitored from the head end down, or sorry, from the head end up. Um, and we're, we're moving against the flow. It doesn't matter which way we go. Uh, we can go um, from head end down, from tail end down, no issue. Um, this is a technology trial we did in 2018-19. Uh, the belt operates periodically, so that means that we were able to get in and make changes when we need to, so to get an idea of better ways to mount fibers, that kind of thing. Um, and uh, that's gonna show on some of the graphs I'm gonna show you, uh, an abnormal x-axis, so it's not a consistent linear x-axis. So if I have um, the, dif the different notches are not necessarily uh, the same amount of time apart. The reason for this is because if the belt wasn't running, we didn't record. And so the failures, the, the sorry, the um, each recording is the one that happened not on a set time. So if we went three days without a recording, you will have no difference in the x-axis on these graphs. All right, so let's have a look at some classics here. This is roller 11611162. So if it's a return roller, we specify it as the, uh, in between two of the carries because the returns are not necessarily numbered. It's an inverted V roller, V shape, um, and the shell and bearing end is separated. Uh, you can actually see here it's completely dropped away. Uh, was detected 10 days earlier than the site managed to detect them. Um, all three of these results I'm going to show you today are actually return rollers. Interestingly enough, the number of carry failures we had was very minimal and they're nowhere near as spectacular in terms of the way they break. They just got noisy. Um, the return idlers, there were much fewer of them. So there were six sets of carries to two returns, sorry, eight sets of carries to two returns uh, with pretty much equal belt tension, uh, meaning that uh, potentially the design of this meant that th there was too much pressure per return or a little bit more than you'd hope for. Um, it meant that the failure rate on returns was about 90% compared 90% returns and 10% carry, uh, just the way it was, even though there was no material directly on the carry. Um, and honestly, the failures are much more spectacular and, and, and interesting visual ones to show you. Uh, so this one here, 
So look, well, at hour zero, this is that we can see here, this is the last time we considered that to be in good condition. Uh, hour 12 to 36, uh, the rattling really kicked up. Uh, we class this as a priority four or a priority three detection at this point between that area. Uh, we'll talk about that priority run being the highest and that's kind of the drop everything, go have a look at this because it might rip your belt in half. Uh, priority two is uh, going to talk about when you actually put this, uh, you know, when you look at um, an inspection, which one should you go and look at? Now remember that this device is not going to replace guys in the field. It's it's not going to completely stop them being out doing inspections. What it is going to do is it's going to give them like a heat map or a hot list of things to go and check. So they'll still, you know, do an inspection, but they're going to look at these five and then they're going to finish up. They're not going to have to manually inspect every single roller every single time. Uh, at hour 42, we had a sustained consistent fault signature and we went to a P to a priority two alarm. At that point, we posted an alarm. Uh, six hours later, um, we're pretty sure that's when the bearing sees based on the noise we had. Uh, and then it wasn't attended to for a little while. Uh, hour 154 uh, is when we suspected that the uh, the bearing end and the shell separated and the rattling became pretty significant. Uh, hour 196 uh, is when it was detected by the site. There was a two-day shutdown as part of this and that is when it was replaced. So it ran for quite some time um, before it was done. The priority, ah, uh, good question from Shane. Are the priorities hard to find within the hardware? Can this be tailored or modified? Here's a fun fact about how sites look at different conditions of failure. What one site will con consider a complete failure, another site will say can run for another week. So as part of the commissioning process, we actually ask you to give us what you consider a complete, a, a priority one, a priority two, uh, failure, because they're the ones we believe you can see. The threes and the fours are basically ones we keep on a watch list. You don't see priority three, four. You only see priority one, two, typically. So the priority one alarm really should be, I'm going to send a guy out, or maybe even I'm going to shut a belt down, although we don't typically recommend that. Uh, priority two, uh, this is one of the heat maps for tomorrow, um, or for the next inspection we're doing in six or eight hours. But that how we work that out is based off the output of our algorithms. Uh, we actually get a, you can see here the parameter two uh, up the y-axis there. I think the maximum that number can be is 1.2. Um, and the, we, we can actually set on the y-axis where we make your unit a priority one or a priority two. So that's kind of the way it's done. Um, there are different things that go into the setting of that y-axis, but that's kind of more it's a bit above my head in terms of the math, and it's honestly probably part of our intellectual um, design and, and, and that kind of thing as well. How accessible is the raw or lower level data? We, you can take a, a raw recording off this. Uh, yes, you can. Uh, sites have generally opted not to use their own API. The reason being um, is, I mean, that's a large portion of what we do and what our technology actually offers. Um, you can, um, it has taken us quite a few years to be able to do this. And effectively what you're looking to be able to do is to take an audio track, which we can hand you, uh, and determine from that to, to basically do audio analysis. Uh, it's not as simple as having a quick listen. Um, typically, if you listened to a recording of a good and bad roller side by side, uh, in a fr from our from our system, I have questions on whether a human being is able to reliably pull one from the other. One of our factors is actually the change in signal over time. So bearings that are failing, they change over over a time period. As you can see, they're, there's they're not they're not static. Um, and even even in here, there is some averaging going on to, to get these nice, nice flat graphs for display. Um, there is some some day to day monitoring and moving, and it's that movement of the actual um, parameters that, that changes. I don't know whether that'd be doable, but I mean, we have no problem giving you that information. Um, it's a lot in terms of data, though. So uh, you're talking about mm, multiple gigs a minute, um, depending on what your depending on the length and the speed that we're running the, the unit at. Ah, so we'll go over alerts in the output section. That's the other one. So Shane is just asking, how are alerts 
generally communicated to site. Uh, I have a couple slides on that that I'll show you in a sec. So let's have a look at idler 1150 to 1151. It is the far idler. Uh, you can see there it has dropped away from the bearing end. Again, inverted V uh, return um, has dropped away. I have tried in an internal uh, meeting to give you the videos from these failing. Uh, they're quite loud, but unfortunately over um, the uh, over this kind of platform, they don't work very well. But I'd be more than happy of, to send you some examples of the actual rollers failing. Again, we detected the failure uh, through the Praetorian system. This was much quicker, as you can see there, uh, like much, much quicker. It's, the whole thing failed in two days. We don't consider this an instantaneous failure, by the way. Um, so hour zero, last recorded condition. Uh, we detected a fault at hour one, uh, suspected bearing failure, uh, shell collapse in 24 hours, hour 48, manually detected by sight. Uh, hour one was our uh, our first ping as a priority two, and then at hour six, a priority one. I haven't written that down there. Um, hour 54. So it took them, even after detection, six hours to get it changed out. And it was a failure, and it was a potential for what they call a pizza cutter, which is where the bearing end uh, runs against the belt and along it, and can actually what we call a, a rip as opposed to a tear, where it rips along the belt. And that can take out multiple sections of belt very, very, very quickly. Uh, the pizza cutter failure, they call it, um, is the worst failure. Um, to talk about the different failure modes, again, we go P1 as a certain failure, send personnel immediately. P2, probable failure, it's part of the heat map and focus. Uh, P3, we don't actually uh, indicate an alarm. Uh, we focus our attention on it for future analysis. Uh, and it kind of goes on our watch list. Uh, P4, there's a vibrational change that we have been able to detect. Uh, there's no alarm, it kind of jumps into that watch list. It doesn't even go up to the repeat analysis section. Um, the interesting thing about these two failures is they were detected at the same time by sight. So one had been failing for days and this one failed, you know, 48 hours before detection. So these were both picked up in that same inspection. So this was during the um, we will alert you and you confirm with us situation. All right, now we get to my favorite one because it exploded. Well, explodes the wrong word. So this one here, uh, it's a flat return roller. Uh, we consider this one a pretty catastrophic uh, failure. Uh, it went through a rapid unscheduled disassembly, which is, I believe, what they call it at uh, SpaceX now. Um, that whole bearing uh, casing there, gone. Um, we're not sure which cause which, although based on our, um, based on our uh, recordings, um, we're probably going to say that the rattling is what caused the gouging um, and the demounting, as opposed to the other way around. It, it, it seems to have seized uh, rattled out and gouged out pretty much instantaneously. Um, the this came out at pretty high speed. It was running at full force, and as you can see, the, there's there's been some pretty significant failure mechanism. This is what we call instantaneous or catastrophic, or spontaneous failure. The whole thing occurred very very quickly. That you know those two points I've I've marked there. That's a one hour time period. But instantaneous is not instantaneous. It's still one hour. So you've got multiple recordings there where you've actually seen those spikes intermittently and consistently beforehand. You can see our kind of modeling line there. Um, we're starting to get some pretty high readings, even, even you know, 20, 30 minutes beforehand when it was probably grinding out. Uh, and then kind of the, the, the heavy rattles that eventually led to the belt being shut, as you can see there, and then changed out. So um, even those spontaneous failures that are uh, the bane of the operator, we're picking them up with this kind of technology because we're there all the time. Uh, Shane, you asked about output. This is an example of what the um, information you would end up with uh, in um, your email each morning, uh, or you're able to log on via a um, via a uh, we host a, a effectively a, a website that you can log into with a um, 
a, a password and you can actually inspect and have a look at information and trends of individual idlers. And so you can see here that the frame, the each idler frame is being uh, specified. The channel one or two is going to specify left hand side or right hand side. Uh, we generally specify with the belt moving away from you left hand side, right hand side, so in the direction of travel. Uh, if we can categorize what kind of failure it is, as you can see here, these n Perlin failures are effectively a, a problem with this particular site where they had a rattle issue um, caused by poor mounting. Again, the mounting is something I'll, I'll kind of touch on as being absolutely critical to the quality. And then the priorities there. So your priority alarms that you get are going to be ones and twos typically. We will put threes and fours up there if you request it. Um, this is obviously one that came to us as, a, as an admin kind of level. Uh, Yes, uh, so Shane has also asked, uh, does the system alert based on the rate of change and not just the magnitude? Yes, there is uh, two functions. There is a, is it over this much? And there is also, how much has this increase accelerated? Is it accelerating, decelerating uh, the rate of increase? So we can actually look at that and go, wow, this has got real bad, real quick. We need to jump that priority up a little bit faster and probably go to an alert status earlier. So we might not even be quite as, it might not even be quite of, as strong as a another failure, but it has progressed so quickly we don't want to leave it. Absolutely, time, time, and, and waiting. We do have a time. We have we have a time weighted component to our algorithm. Um, in fact, that was one of the big aha moments we got as part of this trial that um, those spontaneous failures need to be picked up and alerted to early to give you guys the time to get out there and, and solve a problem. Um, with that, with that very high speed acceleration. Uh, what do we give you? We give you heat maps. Uh, we give you scheduled email reports. We can do priority one SMSs as well to operators. Um, we can set up schedules for who's on shift and that kind of thing, or just have a, a general send out. Um, you can get into our um, uh, graphical user interface via any internet enabled device. Uh, if you've got a if you've got a web browser, you can look at our stuff. And the idea is you'll get a Google Map overlay with with points along a, a lines that are drawn along your site, depending on where the conveyors are. And you can control the level that the user sees, or the admin sees, or your management sees. And then you can start doing things like, well, how many rollers am I holding? Do I, do I have enough based on the failures based on the P3 I've got? You know, let's say I know my P3s typically go in six months. Do I have enough rollers here to cover a major change out? Or are we doing a major change out? Should we just knock all the P3s over now? It's a decision you can now make. Uh, you didn't have the information to make it before. So there's kind of a couple of interesting things you can do in terms of your organization um, with this that makes it a, a bit more of a powerful tool than, than initially, you know, beyond beyond the, the kind of discussion that I'm, I'm kind of having here. Discussion is the wrong word. Um, but we're able to have a a more interesting higher level decision process that can happen. Um, one of the thing, couple of things we're looking at for future. Uh, we're trying to cover everything you can see there. So to do so, we're going to have to pick up bearing heating. We do have a temperature monitoring system. Uh, we also have a capability of installing a fiber for uh, fire detection which is a cantinery, so effectively it's uh, wrapped around a suspended steel wire directly above the belt, uh, just above the height of material carry. Uh, we also want to be able to pick up a belt rip being occurred by a pizza cutter. Um, that kind of noise is something we need to be able to pick up in, uh, in some of our testing here first and, and to try and generate that before obviously we let someone uh, someone lets us tear their belt in half. Uh, tears, one of the main cause of tears is clip failure, so where the, where the, the belts are actually clipped together. Uh, a clip is easily, or a, ba a bad clip is easily audible from standing next to the belt. It's just a case of uh, getting enough of those in the bag uh, to try and be able to develop algorithms for it. So there's plenty of, uh, plenty of options for that. Uh, and then the idea is you capture everything in that box and suddenly you don't have failures anymore. Um, uh, so we're getting pretty close towards the end, guys. Uh, so just if you've got any questions, throw them in the chat bubble. Um, other applications. So uh, the big ones, uh, perimeter security. Um, if you're on a sensitive site or a site that takes things out of the, that other people would like to take off you, um, 
probably worth having a look at. You can put uh, fibers buried in the ground or on fences like you see there. Um, and you're actually able to detect people approaching and or climbing and or cutting your fence and tell who, what, when and where. Uh, you're able to point cameras at them automatically uh, and reduce the number of people who actually need to look at screens on site. Uh, I've done this before uh, in a uh, oil refinery in India. Uh, and the idea there is they want people to stop breaking in and stealing all the tools. One of the biggest problems I had there. Uh, the most common application for uh, fiber optic sensing at the moment is uh, leakage detection. Uh, and effectively using either temperature, if it's buried, with or without um, acoustic. Typically we go acoustic first to detect orifice noise of the leak and also that uh, Thompson Joule effect of the localized cooling, which can also be detected as well. You can see here in a buried application, uh, the danger tape, the actual pipeline itself, the sensing cable and the tracer wire. Uh, slope monitoring. So the idea is you put a fiber directly through the slope with the drill, drop it in, and you can actually pick up uh, strain moving across that fiber. The idea is if you've got a, a slipping event, you're able to see the transverse strain really building up on that cable prior to anything actually moving. You get a bit of a warning that way. Um, we're very interested in this application at the moment. We need to start getting more practical applications rather than just uh, experimental size going. Um, we've had some work in India happening with that. Uh, again, slope monitoring for all sorts of different applications. Uh, whether it's a tailings dam, a water dam, uh, you know, any, any kind of uh, any kind of um, man-made application like that, uh, you can see there's different ways you can put fibers in to uh, reduce the uh, depending on which type type of failure you're looking for. Uh, and this is another one here. Sorry about the terrible photos, but the uh, actual application was interfering with the camera. This is a 30 kilovolt line exploding when we took it to 50 kilovolts and put a nail in it. Uh, so this is for detecting uh, both intrusion on a power up power cable and also uh, arc flash or partial discharge. Um, this was quite fun at a cable manufacturer in Korea. You can see the fiber, which would normally be embedded in the cable actually strapped to the outside there and a, quite a bright flash as the um, uh, steel atomized. Uh, it was quite a violent, violent occurrence. All right, guys. So that pretty much brings me to the end of everything that's scheduled. Uh, if there are any other questions, I'm more than happy to answer them. Um, make sure I uh, send out a email at the end of this to let everyone know, hey, this is me. You can contact me here. Uh, in terms of uh, if anyone's got applications, I'm more than happy to send you guys an application data sheet, which kind of gives me all the information I need to be able to indicate if we can do a particular uh, project. One question I get asked a lot is, can you do garland conveyors? The answer is yes. Um, those those suspended cable, can, uh, suspended uh, roller configurations. Yes, they're uh, just a slightly different way of uh, monitoring, the, monitoring the vibration, especially for that center roller, which doesn't have direct contact. Uh, I'll try and get in, 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 I'll try and endeavor to get a question about your security and networking question uh, sent to me. Any other information, any other questions you have, please let me know. Uh, I'll make sure my email goes out at the end of this and we'll um, we'll go from there. Thanks guys. See everyone later. Uh, Ryan, uh, I'll make sure I give you a call um, to have a chat about uh, that one. Good morning. This is KP Singh from India. Uh, yes. So just I want to know, uh, Mr. Can it be used in our uh, dam, water dam, water reservoir? Yeah, so you've got an earthen wall dam. Pardon? You have an earthen wall dam. Yeah, 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 yeah. Earthen wall dam. Yeah. It's a it's an earthen wall dam. Uh, actually, it's it is required during the flood times. There yes. is there is crack in the dam wall. Yes. So uh, uh, can our can our system give give us prior information regarding any type of crack in the dam wall? Uh, so what it would do is you would you would drill a hole vertically down the dam wall, you would install the cable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
and it would then uh, let uh, you know about he's, changes. He's all... Yeah, yeah. So you, you'd find out about any changes that are occurring along. Wouldn't tell you the initial ground strain because obviously the, the we don't know what it's changed from. But if there was further changes, especially due to seasonal loading, yes, you would be able to pick that up. Okay, that means that the system can be used in this purpose. Correct. Yes. Yes. You have to drill holes into the top of the dam, but yes, you can do it. Hello. Yeah. Hello. Yes. Asad, just one more question. Yes. Um, it, 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 is the system is useful in our you know, oil pipelines, crude pipelines and oil pipelines? Yeah, that photo. Could find I the leakage or any type of sabotage done by. Yeah, so that um, that okay, photo okay, I showed okay. you uh, with the the buried pipe is actually from a crude oil gathering station in uh, South Australia. Okay. okay. Running eight eight inch crude, running about twenty five bar. Okay, okay. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you. No, pro no problem. Okay, bye. Okay, bye-bye. All right, guys. Well, if there's nothing left uh, for questions, I'll uh, see you all next time. Thanks very much, guys.